Good morning. could feel we all wanted to do that. Yeah. Welcome to the Churchill Gals. So good to have you back with us. Good to have the choir back singing with us again after a summer sabbatical. Today is a gathering Sunday, the beginning of our church program year. Our choir starts in earnest. Our Sunday school moves from Sunday summer play back to our normal pattern of summer Sunday school. It's so great to just gather here in this place with each of you and all of you. There's no hoops for you to jump through this morning. Life is busy. Life is hard. We hope that we can find rest and peace and connection here today, that you can feel the spirit move around you and within you. And we hope that this is a restorative place, a friendly place, a place of love, of understanding, and of welcome. Welcome to Sherlock Congregational Church, whether you're in this sanctuary or worshiping with us at home. Just a, a note that um, uh, our uh, COVID protocols have mostly disappeared, but the only thing we ask is, is that when uh, we're singing hymns this morning or responses, that you just slip a mask on just to keep one another safe. Uh, if you don't have a mask, we have some at the entrances in those little bowls, a couple different sizes, small and large. And uh, if you need help with those, just raise a hand and we'll bring one over to you. So dear ones, with that, let's just take a deep breath. And just enter into this sacred time and these sacred places. And let us remember that as followers of the Prince of Peace, that we pray and we work for peace in so many different ways. Today, as we have done since February 24th, we light the peace candle, knowing that war still rages in Ukraine. It has been our pattern to sing Dona Nobis Pacham, but this morning we're going to do something special. 
Cameron has picked out a, uh, a brand new piece by Ukrainian composer Mir Zaraz, which means peace now. So we'll sing that as our response this morning. <clears throat> I invite you to stand as you are able and join me in our opening prayer. As we say together, across the wisdom tradition, we learn this truth. A single twig is easily broken, but a bundle of twigs is strong. Out of our summer rhythms, we gather in the sanctuary as single twigs. Through silence and song, wisdom and word, repetition and refrain, we're bundled together, bound with the love of Christ, strengthened against winds and worries, blessed in our bundling, we pray. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our regathering hymn this morning is number 252. How lovely, Lord, how lovely.
You may be seated. I invite all the children and youth to come forward. And teachers. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you this morning, I'm going to stand here. And if you guys could gather up here um, with your teachers, that would be lovely. It's so good to see everybody. Welcome back. Cannot wait to hear about summers. And um, we're just so excited to start this new Sunday school year. So I wanted to tell you where you're going this morning since the classroom situations are new. So if you are age three or younger, you can be in the nursery with Hannah. And if you are in the grades preschool to first grade, you will be in the room with the sink downstairs with Abby and Hannah will be in there as well. But raise your hand if you're in grades kindergarten, first grade, or maybe older preschool. I see some of you, got it, okay. Okay, raise your hand if you are in grades two, three, or four. Oh yeah, okay. You are gonna be at the hall room, at the classroom at the end of the hallway. And um, Marsha Bristow and I strung some twinkle lights in there this week. It looks really cool. Um, and you'll be with Lewis and Jeannie this morning. And if you are in grades fifth, grades five, six, or seven, you will be with Henry and me in the upper floor of the vestry. So does everybody, do you know where you're going when we leave here? Okay, great. And we know that we're missing um, some friends this morning. So when you see them in school, just tell them that um, you, they are always welcome here. Bring friends when you want to. Um, this morning, right now, I, we're going to have a special blessing of you. So I would ask Kevin and Susan to come and stand. And um, Kevin and Susan, if we could just extend um, our hands over all of you. Charlie, squeeze in a little bit so we could, yeah, squeeze in everybody. Oh yeah, good. <clears throat> Perfect. Okay, so let's close our eyes this morning and feel the love. Wondrous God, thank you for the minds and hearts of these children. May their time here Keep them open to your mystery and guidance. Thank you for all of the adults who invest in the future of our children. Bless the learning of both students and teachers that they encourage one another, laugh with one another, and lift up one another in their time together. Open the words of the Bible stories to their understanding that their lives may spread your love, hope, forgiveness, and joy. Amen. All right, so let's go to Sunday school. <laughs> Now, we usually sing, May the Blessings of God, at the end of the service, but why don't we stand and offer that as a sung blessing to them as they go.
Good morning, everyone. So great to see many of you here, and I know that there are others online. So welcome to Gathering Sunday, because we gather from afar as much as we gather together. This is our time for prayer. Um, are there prayers of petition or joy that you would like to raise this morning? Yes, Emily. Well, so prayers for Emily's niece, um, whose baby should be being born, but he's too comfortable, right? Uh, he's be Excuse me? Anyway, we're saying prayers for both of them, for mother and baby, um, as they look forward to a great new beginning. Anyone else? So I have a few to raise before you. Um, Bethany United Church of Christ in Montpelier, at the end of August, um, the week of August 22nd, experienced two break-ins um, and works that they had an exhibition going in their church and two works, several works of art were taken, um, totaling $4,000. So it just feels violating. Um, and if we pray for all of those who are part of the um, church, and especially for Amy Pitten, who is their pastor. And also for Mark Gable, who is home from the hospital and recovering from his bicycle accident that resulted in infections. Um, he'll be on IV antibiotics for a while to come, but he's doing well and very glad to be home. And we pray also for Heather, who is a friend of uh, the Trina, Trina Webster and Dan Webster and Norman Sandy Riggs. Um, Heather's family recently experienced a grave tragedy, so we hold them in our prayers. Yes, Robert. So prayers. Robert has asked for prayers for all of those who are remembering and experiencing again and again the events of September 11th. And that would encompass, I think, pretty much all of us. So as we remember those events, as we remember all that has happened since then, may we just take a moment before we I offer the prayer. Dear God, small capes of orange and black flutter through the air, not high or especially fast. They float with intention towards milkweed, their favorite, or budlia, aptly called the butterfly bush, or other flowers, scent and sweet. Do they know they are flying all the way to Mexico? They occupy a position in the scheme of fall, and in our awareness, no one wishes a butterfly ill. Some reverence we have for them, truth be known, aptly called monarchs. Ah, now you see. So in the season of butterflies, we pause our obsessive self-regard and honor the flight of another monarch, a queen, no less, who also, with well-adorned intention, winged her way through her people, through history, calamity, war, and chaos, not fast, but sure, toward the journey ahead traveling mercies to monarchs all, whether insect or sovereign, it doesn't matter to you, does it? All creatures of our God now sing. We return to our beginnings time and again, 
some slowly through wandering trails of memory and recollection, some abruptly through tragedy, some along the natural flow of wane, we all come home to your embrace to be renewed and refreshed, to become one with light and love at our beginnings and at our endings over and again until time vanishes and glory reigns. Amen. Yeah. 
Good morning. Our first reading this morning from the Gospel of Luke, chapters 12, 1 through 7, tells the Christmas story of Jesus being born into the world. Let us listen together. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Our second reading this morning from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, 14a, is another telling of the Christmas story, a poem about the word become flesh. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. May God bless this reading and hearing. So on this late December Sunday, no, wait on this, mid-September Sunday, we have two very different tellings of the Christmas story. A story that's about what? About uh, Caesar Augustus in a Roman census. A story about Mary and Joseph in an overcrowded inn and a manger. A story about the pre-existent word, light shining in the darkness like we hear in John's Gospel. Certainly, these are the themes uh, in the story and characters and the poetry of the story, but in the end, it's not really what the story is all about. That the story is all about, in my reading, is about this great theological term, the incarnation. This novel idea that God chooses not to be a hermit, not to hole up in heaven, not to hide from creature and creation, but that God chooses to break into history, to become incarnate, enfleshed in a person named Jesus. Why? So that God could know us and that we could know God human to human, intimate, F to F, face to face. That was a line from the last week's sermon, if you remember that. So uh, on this gathering Sunday, 2022, with the beginning of our church program year, I am mindful of the, uh, the fact that two and a half years of social distancing and masking has changed the church gathering patterns for so many of us, and that it continues to be difficult and challenging and complicated for us to gather physically together. For example, uh, in, in church on Sunday mornings like now, we have some of us who are worshiping here, but we have some who are worshiping at home and some who worship throughout the week. Our attendance is good, but it just feels different than it used to. We have our church committee meetings that meet as much as they always have, but mostly we're online these days, which makes sense because it's more efficient and we don't have to drive and it's a shorter commitment. So there's good things about that, but uh, but we're not meeting face to face with one another. And when we do, it's maybe three times a year, four times a year at most. So I don't know if this is the new normal. I don't know if we'll ever go back to uh, the way things were before COVID-19, but I do know this, that the church gathering patterns have changed over the past two and a half years. And so I'm wondering this morning, in light of the Christmas story, what 
What are the lessons from the incarnation for us in such a time as this? Let's pray. Loving God, how glorious, how wonderful that we can gather like this on Sunday morning. Some in this place, some in other places, some worshiping at another time, but still one congregation to break open the word and there find gospel and life and love enough for today. Join us always. Amen. So those of you who know my preaching style, you know that I like to preach in sets of three, right? Three points or three themes or three people. I like to I like threes. But this morning, I'm going to change the pattern up. And I'm not going to give us three lessons from the incarnation. I'm going to give us two lessons from the incarnation. And the first lesson is this, <clears throat> that when we gather physically together, life happens. Think about the Christmas story. So, uh, as we said, Jesus um, is God incarnate, according to the story. And uh, that same Jesus who becomes incarnate in the world goes on to live and to teach and to heal and to feed and then to be crucified and resurrected. And so, according to the tradition, this process of incarnation through life and death and resurrection, this is, this is the, the visible way that God makes it so clear to us with eyes to see that God ain't playing, that, that, that death won't win, that death for Jesus or for any of us is not the last word. And so built into the story is this arc from incarnation to life for all of us and forever. Gathering together brings life which I know is a wonderfully theological way to say it, so I'll quote from the top of your bulletin today. This wonderful quote I found from Alice Waters, who was a chef and a, a restaurateur, and she says this so wonderfully, this is the power of gathering. It inspires us delightfully to be more hopeful, more joyful, more thoughtful, in a word, more alive. When we gather, it brings life. But then there's the second lesson, which is equally as important from the incarnation, and that is that we can be together without being together. We know that there are many among us who are immunocompromised. We know that there are folks who have difficulty moving around and getting into buildings like this on Sunday morning or any other time of the week. We know there are some of you who are caregivers who need to be home to care for loved ones. We know, too, that life is hard and busy. We have busy families and busy jobs, and there's commitments all over the place. And sometimes the last thing we need to do to spill our spiritual cups is to come to church. Sometimes we just need to be home, and that's okay. But the good news is that built into our story, time and again, is a lot of storytelling about how we can be together without being together. God has set it up this way. There's this thing that we in this tradition don't talk about maybe as much as God and Jesus, but there's this, the Holy Spirit, God's presence among us. And that by staying connected to the Holy Spirit and being filled by the Holy Spirit, that that allows us to stay connected to God and to God's people. So we, we have this wonderful story in Acts chapter 1, this, this time when Jesus is leaving and the church is trying to figure out how to carry on and to be Christ's hands and feet in the world. And so in Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascends. He goes up into the sky, but we're told that we will, we will be filled by the Holy Spirit, that we will be able to be Christ's hands and feet and to spread the gospel of God's love throughout the world, that we can be together as the church without always being together with Jesus and with one another. So a second lesson is that we can be together without being together. So let's get practical. So if these are the two lessons of the incarnation that I offer this morning, that gathering physically together brings life and that we can be together without being together, then what does that look like? What's the application for that in our lives as a community, as individuals, as families? And as we think about regathering in the beginning of the church program year, what is the wisdom here for us as the Sherlock Congregational Church? 
So I'll start with this. Uh, if gathering physically together brings life, I'm going to just encourage you and maybe even push a little bit to gather physically together more often when that is safe and responsible and healthy to do so. So I don't know about you, but I've kind of gotten out of the rhythm of gathering with people and I'm much more willing and ready to stay home or to stay distant and gathering together for any reason, church or not, is just I'm slower to do that. I even think about doing it less. It's not sort of my natural reaction to do that. But on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock, we gather here and life comes when we see one another. So I'm going to invite us all to come to church because I love you and I like to see you and you love one another and good stuff happens when we gather. So maybe you haven't been here in a while, and you're at home, that's great, and there's lots of good reasons to be at home, but think about coming in from time to time. Maybe if you come once a month, maybe come twice a month, a little bit. There's no shame, there's no pressure here, just invitation, encouragement, because good stuff happens when we gather. For committee meetings, those of us who are involved in ministries, ministry chairs and teams, uh, that um, so often, I think most of the time now, we gather online. And that's great and efficient and there's good things that come out of that. But maybe just think about setting a schedule so that you meet maybe quarterly in person. Come together and share some coffee or some hors d'oeuvres or maybe even a glass of wine. And just be together in your meetings. Maybe meet after church on Sundays so that you just come down here once and save that extra drive. Just think about it. Think, too, about whatever your relationship to this church is, whatever your role in this church is, whether it's here or in the other areas of your life, don't just default to being on Zoom, which has really become the case in my life. I think I'm preaching to myself as much as anybody else this morning. But that say, huh, could we gather? What's the benefit of gathering? We haven't done that in a while, so huh, let's gather physically together because life comes when we gather. All right, so the second uh, lesson in the application of that, that we can be together without being together, which sounds all great and wonderful and the Holy Spirit, blah, blah, blah. But how do we do that? How do we stay connected to the Spirit so that we can stay connected to everyone else the Spirit's connected with? How do we get filled with the Holy Spirit? I know it sounds so abstract, but it's really not. There's some real concrete ways that we can we can develop spiritual practices to, to, to stay connected. So let's go back to worship. Many of you worship at home, either synchronously at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings or you worship throughout the week. But I know that when I've done that, I'm in front of a screen and all of a sudden worship's up in this corner and I'm buying things on Amazon and I'm looking at <laughs> plane fares, right? You know, and I'm going back and forth to make a cup of coffee. And so it's kind of on and I'm watching, but not really worshiping. So there's a craft to that, right? One way we can stay connected is to invite the spirit in and the practice of worship when we're worshiping in front of our screen. So when we hold silence, you can hold silence at home. When we sing hymns, you can sing hymns as loudly as you want. Uh, we have prayer time. You can pray. You can put your prayer concerns into the Zoom chat, and Tom and Deirdre will grab those. Or you can give those to Susan and me before the service or after the service and participate in that prayer time. So just not watch, but worship if you're worshiping at home. Committee meetings, right? We, uh, we meet online, and like I said, there's lots of really good and wonderful reasons to do that. But I know that I have found... I get very businessy in that environment. There's something about not meeting in the church building. I forget that we're a church group at all. We've got tasks, we've got uh, business to conduct. And I find myself often forgetting to pray or, or inviting others to pray. We just do the business and we go. And so a real simple way to stay connected to the spirit, create some sacred space in those meetings. Remember that those are spiritual growth up deep in your relationship with God and God's people, pray at the beginning, pray at the end, and maybe even consider doing a scripture reading and a brief devotional. The deacons do that every month, and the cabinet does that every month. 
And it's a wonderful, brief, and simple way to create sacred space and invite the Spirit in. Okay, lastly, last practical application. And this one, I think, maybe is the most important, or at least it was the sort of new idea for me this week, the courier. We have the courier in this church. This is an email that comes to your inboxes. I hope that you all get it, and if you don't get it, to talk to me and we can get you on that list. It is a wonderful record of the ways that the Spirit is moving in this church and all the programs that we're involved in, the ways that we're answering God's call, and I know that your inboxes are as overflowing as my inbox, and the courier is long because there's lots of wonderful stuff going on here. So it's easy to not read it. I know there's only 52% of opens every week, all right? So we get the statistics, and that's okay because life is busy and our inboxes are full. There's no shame or pressure here. But I just thought we could reframe the courier. Rather than this long list that takes a ton of time to read and probably leads to commitments on the calendar in a world that's already full of commitments on your calendar, maybe we just put that aside and we look at the courier as a prayer resource. It comes in your inbox. You don't even have to open it up and just say, God, I know that there's so many programs. People are excited about this and excited about that. There's Christian education and missions and social justice and worship, and there's this trip and that outing and this youth group opportunity. And wrapped up in all of that is you, God, and the way that you're leading people. And people have their hopes and their fears and their dreams about all of those programs. And so God, I just ask for a blessing on the courier, a blessing on all of these different events that are happening. And it changes it from a to-do list item to a way to spiritually connect, to create sacred space at your desk, and to stay involved in the lives of those in the congregation who you are blessed to call friends and, and family. So I know that over two and a half years of social distancing, our church gathering patterns have changed so much. We wonder, are we going to go back to the no old normal? Is this the new normal? And we're going to have to wait to see how that all sugars off. But while it sugars off, and as we gather this fall and into the winter and Advent and the spring and Lent and Easter and all of that, as we go through this cycle of the church year, I encourage us to remember the lessons of the Incarnation. The gathering is really good, but that we can be together through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit when we can't physically be together. Some things to remember for our life together in this church and family. May it be so in Christ's name and for the life of the world. Appropriately this morning, our closing hymn is We Gather Together.
Please be seated. If you hear yourself singing this morning, you sound gorgeous, wonderful. So at the end of our service, just a, a few announcements to make. Uh, this afternoon at 3 o'clock, we will have this wonderful and rare opportunity to have a tour of the Lost Mural at Ojave Zedek Synagogue in Burlington. Uh, Rick Kirshner, where's Rick? Oh yeah, Rick Kirshner there. He's been involved in the moving and restoration of that lost mural since the 80s. And it, for the past, past seven years or so, it has resided at Ojave Zedek. And it was just restored, like finished rest restoration last month or, or you know, just about six weeks ago. So anyway, it's a, it's a wonderful, rare painting um, of a kind of art that used to exist all over Europe. But during World War II, when the Nazis came, they destroyed it intentionally. And so we have this, um, this example here right in Burlington of this kind of art that is rare and wonderful. And so Rick is going to go there with us. We're meeting uh, a person from Wahhabi Zedek that will give us a tour, uh, tell us a little bit about the restoration process and its historical importance. We've got a wonderful group of about 18 right now that are planning to go, but there's more room. So if you're interested, you can see Rick or see myself and we'll get you connected in. Or you can just show up at Ojabi Zedek at about 2.50 and meet in the parking lot there. Uh, and Rick, thank you for, for your time in organizing that. Um, this Wednesday, uh, the 14th, I'm starting an every week uh, short Bible study called the Wake Up Word at 8.30 in the morning, 8.30 to 9.00. We will meet by Zoom. I know there's irony there, but we will meet by Zoom and uh, trying to find a, a way to, uh, to, 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 to have Bible study for busy people. So drop the kids off at the bus or at school or whatever, and, uh, or whatever your schedule is, and pop on for 30 minutes. We'll keep that strict, and uh, we're going to take a different person each week and study them now through the middle of November, and then we'll start again in the, in the spring. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Linda Reynolds. Linda. Yeah, Linda. Linda is a wonderful painter and uh, artist and teacher, and her artwork has been hanging in our vestry for quite a while. But there are 26 different paintings, or even now at the La Charlotte Library, and we'll be there all month. And so I invite you to go down there and check those paintings out. I'll also let you know that uh, on Tuesday from 2.30 to 5, right, you'll be there and you've got some greeting cards. And so you'll be able to be selling those and, and talking to people about your artwork. And then the next four Thursdays, uh, you have some art classes that will be taking place in different locations around Sherlock. So if people are interested, come and talk to you or sign up at the Sherlock Senior Center. Right. Wonderful. Thank you. And I will be down there myself. Can't wait to see it all. Uh, let's see, um, Stanley Kirshner and the Social Justice Ministry wanted, to let, wanted me to let you know that on Thursday, September 15th from 5.30 to 6.30, there's going to be an informational webinar through the Vermont Conference United Church of Christ about um, Vermont Proposition 5 or Article 22, sometimes it's called to, about the Reproductive Freedom Amendment to our state constitution. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important topic, and we invite you to connect in. If you want more information about that, come and see me, and I'll make sure that you have the Zoom link and everything you need to get connected. Uh, next Sunday, I just want to let you know that both Deirdre and Tom are likely not to be here. So we will not have live streaming next Sunday. Perfect opportunity to come down here if you can, and that's safe for you to do that. But what we will do is we will have an audio recording and some still images. And so we will put up a video uh, on Sunday afternoon so that you can still um, get your worship fix online throughout the week. Uh, next Sunday, our Burlington Pride Parade, and we will have our youth group going down there and some others as well from Social Justice Ministry. So if you're interested, if you want to march in the, the annual Pride Parade, come and see me and we'll, we'll get you connected. We need, we need people to help hold the rainbow flag. So um, we'd love to have you. Uh, lastly, I just want to mention today, so much going on, I know, but one of the exciting things that's happening is, is that we are starting new member classes, as we often do this time of year. We have a wonderful group of uh, in folks who are interested in membership. So if you are interested in membership, we are going to meet at 4 o'clock at Susan's home in Shelburne, uh, just for an hour, and just to talk about the membership process. And no commitment, just an informational session. And then after that, those who are interested in continuing on, we will have two more sessions before the new members join in worship one Sunday. So 
an opportunity for you to, to think about membership, what that means to you, uh, being a, uh, a member in this family in a different way. And um, uh, we'd love to have you talk about that. If the 25th doesn't work for you, just come and talk to Susan or me, and we will uh, find another way to connect you in. That's what I got. Anything else this morning? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. So Dr. Stetson is telling us that there is a uh, annual lecture at UVM uh, about autoimmune uh, disorders, and that will be on Friday, February 23rd. No, September 23rd. Where am I? Uh, from 12 to 1 p.m. in person at the Sullivan Auditorium, but also online as well. Yeah, thank you for continuing to do that. Other news or announcements this morning? Yes, please. Um, refugees and asylum seekers, often called New Americans, but that's a controversial term, that, which we can talk about. Um, so it's going to be in the career. So look, we're, we're hoping to have it at the end of October. And last year we did it and it was successful, but last year we had it for all sorts of winter clothing. But what came to be very clear is people were really looking for coats and boots. So look in the career. Wonderful. Thank you, Krista. Thank you for continuing to do that and keep us connected to our new immigrants. Anything else this morning? Well, I forgot to say this last week, so I'll say it now, that um, we thank you for your generosity and the donations that you contribute to this congregation so that we can do all those things listed in the Courier and to live out our mission and ministry. So uh, we invite you to give as you are called and able. Uh, there are collection plates at the entrances on uh, your way out, or you can give online, and there's a, there's a donate button on our website as well. We thank you so much for staying connected in this way and for partnering in that way. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Friends, with that, I invite you to stand. And since we already sang, may the blessings of God, after the benediction, we will sing another song. For that. We thank you for this time, this place, these places, and the sacred spaces that you're making. Take us out into the world today, renewed, refreshed, re-energized for the road ahead. Be love in us, and be love through us always. Oh, sure we do. Sorry. Sit down. <laughs> Please. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Someday when my last line is written, someday when I've drawn my last breath, when my last words on earth have been spoken, and my lips are sealed in death, don't look on my cold form in pity, don't think of me as one dead. It'll, It'll just, just be the house I once lived in. My spirit by then will have fled. I'll have finished my time here allotted, but I won't be in darkness alone. I will have heard from heaven the summons to come on home. 
And when my body is in the grave, don't think that I'll be there. I won't be dead but living in the place Jesus went to prepare. And after all is said and done, Know that my last earnest prayer is that my loved ones be ready someday to meet me Go in peace.